This is the ADCOM GFA 5500 power amplifier, and this unit is suffering from what seems to be a relatively common issue with these models, and that's weak bass. Indeed, I connected this to my test speakers, and it does sound really hollow, especially at the lower end. So let's see what it takes to fix it. The first thing to do is to verify that we have an issue. Now, I've already done this myself with the test speakers, but you're definitely not going to be able to hear a weak bass issue through my microphone, so I thought I'd show you. There are at least a few ways to do this. First, I'm injecting a 1 kHz square wave into the amplifier. This is the input signal. In a healthy amplifier, the output will look just like the input, maybe with a little bit of distortion. But here's what ours looks like. Much, much different than the input. This sloping downward on the top half and sloping upward on the bottom half are classic signs of poor low frequency response. We can also use sine waves. So now my signal generator is sweeping from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, or the entire audio range. Theoretically, the amplitude of these waves should remain constant throughout the entire sweep, but obviously they're not. At the low end, we're sitting at about one or two divisions on the scope, and at the high end, we're at about six divisions. So there's some very obvious attenuation or signal reduction happening here at the low end. That's enough jib-jab for now. Let's see what it looks like inside. All right, let's take a look around before we get started. In the front, we have this giant toroidal transformer labeled ADCOM. On the bottom, in the back here, we have four very large filter capacitors. These will smooth out the high voltage rails. On the top, we have eight smaller filter capacitors to smooth out the lower voltage rails, along with some additional components on the board here. And then on either side is the amplifier board. So this is the left channel's board, this is the right. Now I'm fairly confident I know exactly what's causing this issue, and so I'm not going to actually do any live troubleshooting right now. And I'm going to focus on just one channel, since both channels are exhibiting the same problem. So for now, I'm going to remove this entire amplifier module with the heatsink, and we can take a closer look. Okay, here's the right channel's amplifier board, and it's in really good shape. Now, I've studied the schematic quite a bit, and I'm fairly confident that there's just one component responsible for this issue, and that's this component here. This is C3. It's a 47 microfarad at 50 volt electrolytic capacitor. Now, I'm going to remove the board from the heatsink, and we'll pull and test this capacitor. Here is our suspect capacitor, C3, and here is a brand new high quality audio grade capacitor of the same exact values, 47 microfarad at 50 volts. You can see we're measuring 45.8 microfarads. So no problems there. For reference, the tolerance on these types of capacitors are usually plus or minus 20%. So on the low end, that's gonna be in the high 30s. This is obviously well within spec as expected. Let's measure C3. Our C3 is measuring just 0.3 nanofarads, so not even close to the spec, thousands of times less capacitance than the brand new one. This is definitely a problem. Let's install the new capacitor, test it, and if it works, we'll explain what's going on here. All right, we're all back together again, or at least good enough for testing. Let's run our square wave test again. Let's see if we've made any improvement after the capacitor change. I have the same one kilohertz square wave at the input. That's this signal here. Let's take a look at the output. It's much better. It's very, very close to the input. So let's run the sine wave sweep test now. 
Once again, we're sweeping from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, the entire audio range. Only this time, the amplitude at the low end is exactly matching the amplitude at the high end. We have our bass back. So great, we've resolved the bass issue, but why was C3 causing that issue? This is the schematic for the amplifier board, and the schematic is the same for both channels. Here's our failed C3 up here, and this is part of the input section. It's actually part of the feedback network, which I've highlighted in orange. So we have our output signal being fed back through this 49.9K ohm resistor. It's then going through our C3 here, which is in parallel to another capacitor C4. It goes through a 10K ohm resistor before going to ground. Now it's a little bit busy over here, so I've redrawn this so it's easier to see. Here's our feedback coming from the right. I rounded the 49.9K ohm resistor to 50K. Here are the two capacitors in parallel, C3, and the other capacitor is just 0.22 microfarad. And then we have the 10K ohm resistor to ground. Now capacitors block DC, of course, but they do pass AC. So for the signals we're concerned with, audio signals, we can just think of these two capacitors as a resistor in series with this resistor. Now I've replaced the two capacitors in parallel with a resistor. And under normal circumstances, when C3 is equal to 47 microfarad, this resistor is equal to 170 ohms at the low end at 20 hertz, and less than one ohm at the high end at 20 kilohertz. Now, 170 ohms might sound like a lot, but really you have to compare that to this resistor. 170 ohms to 10K is almost nothing, so this is virtually a dead short at 20 hertz, and it's certainly a dead short at 20 kilohertz. So really, this resistor goes away when the capacitor is at 47 microfarads of capacitance, and we have just a simple voltage divider. We go through 50K ohm and then 10K ohm to ground. That's under normal circumstances. So let's see what happens when C3 is much, much lower than 47 microfarads. When we measured C3, it was nowhere near the 47 microfarads we expected. It was unbelievably low at just 0.3 nanofarad. At this capacitance, at the high end, or 20 kilohertz, this resistor is still just 36 ohms. So we can still consider this a short at the high frequencies. At the low end, however, at 20 hertz, this resistor turned into 36,000 ohms. So we can no longer ignore this resistor. If we add it in series to this resistor, we get one resistor with a value of 46,000 ohms. What that means practically is, the feedback signal that's sent at the low end to the input is about three times as large as what's fed back at the high end. And so the more feedback you provide at the input, the lower your signal at the output. So hopefully that should make sense as to why you get a poor bass response because we have such a low value for C3. It's outside the scope of this video, but I'll let you know what else I plan on doing with this unit. Certainly I'm gonna clean all of the dust out. I only replaced one of the three electrolytics on the right amplifier board. I'm gonna replace the other two as well. There is a overtemp switch mounted to the heatsink right here. When I had this apart, I noticed that the thermal compound had started to dry up, so I will clean and replace that. And then I'll do the exact same thing to the left amplifier board. I will measure all four bulk electrolytic capacitors here for ESR and capacitance. I'd be very surprised if there were problems with these. They are very high quality and they usually last quite a long time, but if there are any problems or signs of problems, we'll look at replacing those. I'll also measure the ESR and capacitance of these eight smaller filter capacitors on top. I would not be as surprised if there were problems with these. When it's all back together, I will set up the bias and DC offset for both channels as per the service manual. After that, when everything's done, I think this unit will run really, really well and for a very long time. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.